This clip is brought to you by SaveWithConrad.com. Let's talk about uh, some more context from the era. You work with Ahmed in Fitchburg, Massachusetts, in front of 3,500. Ahmed gets the win. When you're getting ready for a big pay per view like the Royal Rumble, it feels like in this era they would pair you with that guy a lot on the house shows. Are you trying to build what your pay per view match looks like? Is it, does it almost become like a dress rehearsal? Well, and look, Ahmed, and I know that he, I'm not on his favorite list, uh, and he may or may not believe this, but I was coming back into the company and I wanted, and I knew that they put me with him to get the very best match out of him and try to teach him. Now, look, he was older than me, uh, you know, um, didn't have many years as far as in-ring work, but you know, and so I tried to figure out how can I have not just a passable match, a pretty good match with, with Ahmed. And so, yes, that was the mindset that, uh, Bruce and Pat and, and obviously Vince, uh, back in those days booking live events, but yeah, that was the whole mindset. Let's let these guys work out on the road. And by the time we ask people to pay as in pay-per-view to see this match, they've got it down. It's a good one. They've got their timing down. They've got spots down. They got false finishes. They can go tell a good story. So that's exactly what this era was in Fitchburg. I remember that, uh, good house. What do you have a number on what it did? I bet it was good. Uh, 3,500 folks. Uh, that's probably a sellout. It's probably good. I mean, yeah, that, that's decent. I'm not arguing that at all. I, I'm just, yeah, I'm trying to recall, but yeah, good little arena. So let's talk about, um, the actual pay-per-view itself. We're here at Royal rumble, 1996. You're opening the show for two rumbles in a row. Of course, the prior year you had your big moment with razor Ramon. Now you get Ahmed Johnson. And, and I just want to take a time out right now here, because I get that as you and I are talking here in 2022, we've got a ton and thank you guys for being a part of it. We've got a ton of smart listeners who were fans who grew up loving wrestling and now they're studying wrestling and they're trying to learn more. And we, as a group of quote unquote, smart fans have collectively decided, oh, Ahmed Johnson, LOL, but buddy in this era, Ahmed Johnson was a breakout star. Ahmed Johnson was getting big pops from the crowd. He had a different look. It was something the WWF had not tried. He was different than they didn't make him Ahmed Johnson, the gardener. They didn't make him Ahmed Johnson, the garbage man. He was not Ahmed Johnson, the plumber. He was just Ahmed Johnson. And he was an ass kicker with cool music who was representative of a fan base that they had probably not really keyed in on. Um, and he looked like a million bucks. I mean, let's, let's just tell it like it is now so. <laughs> when the bell rang, was he the best wrestler? No, but a lot of the biggest stars of the eighties were not as well. And, and, and here we are in early 96, there's going to be a guy debut in September of 97 named Goldberg. He proved being a great wrestler is not required. You don't have to be this seasoned veteran. You just have to have intensity and a cool look. You got to be able to connect with the audience. That's most important. Ahmed Johnson was doing that here. And it's fun for us to go back and say, oh, it wasn't very good. Blah, blah. But that doesn't mean that there wasn't something in Ahmed. And I'm sure we're going to talk about some bad stuff here today too, Jeff, but I'm sure you agree wearing your promoter's hat. Well, certainly Ahmed's worth a try. Look at how their fans are responding to him, right? Yes. And that's what I'm saying is the identity. Um, he didn't, he wasn't a Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels. That goes without saying, but his look, there's nothing that when he walked through the curtain that you didn't say there's box office, he will connect that there's that he's got the, a unique, um, you know, no, you know, but promo skills, it, it's, it, it goes back to the emotional connection, but coming through the curtain million dollar look, um, and, and, and it was a new era. I don't want to call it the, 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 the you know, it, it, it just, and I understood while I was working with him, all right, let's double J get in there and, um, get the very best match you can out of him. I looked on some of the cards going through this research and I'm looking like, uh, let me think if there's a point of discussion here. Who else could they have matched him up with? I'm sure there's a few, but I can see why uh, Bruce and Pat uh, and Vince said, yeah, let's put Double J with him. 
So let's talk about the match itself. Meltzer says, uh, I'm at Johnson beat Jeff Jarrett by DQ in six minutes and 40 seconds. Johnson is really green. The transitions from spot to spot were weak. Let me pause right there, Jeff. I know you're fixing to take a big sip, but I want to ask a question. I had the, the good fortune of sitting, uh, in a box for all in over here. And, uh, and I got to sit in there with Sean Waltman. He came in for Starcast and wasn't doing anything on the show. So I said, Hey man, do you want to come sit with us? And sure enough, he did. And, uh, we got to watch a lot of the matches together. And one of them was Stephen Amell wrestling Christopher Daniels. And he said, man, he's got all the spots and stuff done. He's just got to get the transitions down. And it was fun just to hear a wrestler talk and he could tell that I didn't respond and I was just letting it lay out. And I sort of looked at him like there's more to that thought. And he <laughs> says, that's where you really hone your craft is knowing all the stuff in between, you know, figuring out how to do the moves is important, but not as important as how do I get from this to that? And that sort of explanation, I don't think anybody had ever said before, but I think when a lot of guys go to wrestling school. They probably are really excited about how to do the big moves, but it's the stuff in between that separates an opening match guy with the main event guy, right? Well, when you say, Hey, that guy can work. Well, let me say this. When I say, when I think that, when I'm saying, Hey, how's this guy? And I say, Hey, Conrad, this guy, he can really work. That's really what I'm talking about. He knows how to carry himself from the time he comes to the curtain till he actually, how he gets in the ring, how he circles, how he locks up, forget all the moves. Uh, they're often referred to as transition. Some folks, uh, refer to things in a match called a rest hold. I used to just scratch my head and go, okay, I, I get it psychologically or intellectually why you want to say this guy's resting, but really what he's doing is working and he's working. And I say that in, you are getting the audience engaged emotionally. So working can also be translated into, Hey, that guy knows how to connect emotionally with his audience. He's working the audience, not trying to say, Oh, it's a work. And he's carny. He's trying to pull the wool. No, 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 no. I'm saying he's given a lot of effort into doing honing his crap. So I'm going to work hard. And as a part of that work hard, it is convey emotion that this is exactly the roller coaster ride I want to take you on. So, uh, transitions, rest holds, um, learn how to lose more importantly than learn how to win all those kind of things. It goes with working. Uh, so yeah, good. Uh, that's why these podcasts are fun. Conrad sort of get granular in this kind of conversation. And who would have thought, do you think my grandmother's rolling over in her grave saying, Jeffrey, what are you doing? Talking about working on a podcast, but it's okay. No, I, I don't, I don't think she would think that. I think when we show her those disbursements on or around the fifth of the month and she'd say, how many bumps did you have to take for that baby? And you'd say, not a one mama. I didn't even leave the house. <laughs> God, right. I'm just saying, just saying, I love that. Yeah. The, but no, you know what I'm saying? It's, uh, yes. Uh, it, the, and so we started on this and you're the one that told us how to build a watch says, tell us what time it was, but Meltzer said, what, what did it say? His transition, uh, boy, he's green. What was Meltzer's comment? He's right. God, yes. uh, Ahmed could do the Pearl River plunge and he literally could look at the audience at the hard camera or look at a handheld and connect emotionally, but going from a to B to C to D all the way through the match, he didn't have the experience. He just didn't. And that's what takes time. Let's, uh, let's jump into it. Meltzer would continue to say Jarrett tried to carry it, but it's hard when nobody buys Johnson being in trouble because he's so physically impressive and doesn't know how to sell to overcome the impressive size. So let's stop right there because we can get a little more granular about in ring work here. There's something to that. Like there's a lot to that. It's I, kind of what I just said. I, I believe from a, a modern wrestling piece of business. It would be really hard for Charlotte to be a baby face in WWE. I bring this up because I saw a lot of fans, uh, say, Hey, maybe what we should do is since fans are already sort of rejecting Ronda Rousey, maybe Charlotte becomes the baby and Ronda's the heel. Cause Ronda, I think would be a great heel. 
However, it's so hard once that program is over to imagine Charlotte as a baby face. She's bigger than everybody. How can she be the sympathetic baby face if she's bigger than everybody and has more title wins than everybody? Like at that point, how can you be an underdog? How can we feel sympathy for you? Um, it's sort of like, you know, nobody feels bad for somebody crying tears that they wipe away with a Louis Vuitton handkerchief. You know, it, it, I, I just don't know how that would be. And so for a new guy, like Ahmed Johnson, it probably is incredibly hard because what got you here is this big impressive body but now that you've got it figuring out how to make that work as a sympathetic baby face that's a square peg round hole we're gonna go in a rabbit hole and talk about yeah. charlotte let's do it <laughs> when you look at her skill set and you know what I think about her skill set. I don't, I think she's the very best. A guy asked me at an autograph signing not long ago, if you had one talent and you were going to start a wrestling company with just one out of everybody out there, who would you start the company with? And I looked at him and I said, Charlotte Flair. And he looked back at me and goes, what? I said, okay, tell me in 2022, think of all the talent out there and you only get one draft choice. You only get one. Who is it? Look on AEW roster, look on, you know, WWE and all, all this kind of stuff. And here's kind of at the very top of the list. Yes, her looks, her lineage, her skill set, her interview, blah, blah, blah. But also in 2022, when you have a Penn State trans gender swimmer winning records and how society is, how come you don't think Sami Zayn could get heat on Charlotte and the whole world wouldn't want to see Charlotte kick Sami Zayn's ass. Well, there's that. And you and I, you and I have talked about that though, but we're a little weird. We both think Charlotte should be wrestling dudes. I don't think that's weird. It wasn't weird. in 1999 when China was kicking my ass and I'm not saying keep Charlotte 12 months out of the year wrestling guys. I'm not saying that I, I, I completely concur with you. In the female division, but I all think Rhonda could be a heel in this instance. That's a whole different, but for the most part, Charlotte's a heel. But on the one off, occasionally for a big mania moment or a big SummerSlam moment, Charlotte wrestling for the Intercontinental title against the Sami Zayn. Are you kidding me? Oh, well, they would boo that just the positioning. But I get what you're saying. <laughs> I, th there is a way to do it. Uh, and I hope that when they do it, they, they bring you back and cover your ass in flower one more time. Uh, assistant manager for the 38th time. Here we go. Oh uh, uh, yeah. But, but, but go ahead. I'm in. Yeah. After a sidewalk slam called the spine buster, my McMahon, although it's not the same move as the one Arn Anderson does Johnson did a dive over the top rope and crashed into the guardrail in the process. What do you remember seeing this? Now this is, I want to give everybody context. This is January 96. Yes. This is not Wednesday night in March of 2022. We see that every week now, and it's commonplace, but to see that happen in January of 96 is a big deal. And it's even bigger when you consider that he is not for lack of a better term, a luchador. This is a heavyweight capital H. He's 260, 280, maybe 300. And I can remember going said, I, I mean, what we kind of need here is I don't, my size, all the, we don't, we need to tell the story that you stop yourself. And what Dave's referring to as far as transitions and not knowing how to work that style, Ahmed could do the, this exact spot. I'm going to crash and burn on my own. And the only thing double J did was, was get out of the way. And then I act like I'm the greatest thing since sliced bread, but really I was chicken shit and moved from the dive, but that's kind of the whole magic of it. Ahmed could do this move in a devastating holy shit moment like you said in 1996 a guy 280 diving over the rope but then crashed and burned and then our transition as x-pac refers to wasn't there yeah. all the emotion was just zapped out we we i tried to get mileage but he comes to his feet and i gotta run him into the post you know it's just the selling the emotional connection never quite got there ever in his career in my opinion Let's, uh, let's keep going here. Johnson then did a, a full somersault splash off the top and missed selling his knee. Jarrett used the figure four, but Johnson reversed it. 
He tried it a second time, but Johnson kicked him out of the ring. Jarrett came in with a guitar and came off the top, smashing it on Johnson's head for the DQ. The guitar shot sounded great. Johnson kneeled over from the spot, but recovered before Jarrett was back in the dressing room and got up and ran after him, but never caught him star in a quarter top rope guitar shot. Uh, do you remember who the agent was on this and how that creative came to me? I wish we did. Um, I heard, uh, Cornette referred to, he had agent reports, everything kind of, I'm surprised the ad free family. We don't get, uh, we don't have access to agent reports. We should, we should. Uh, but no. I, I don't remember. I, I don't remember, but I do remember being super frustrated. Uh, if I memory serves me correctly, I don't think it was right on the spot, I, but it was sometime during this night. I'm like, Bruce, if he's going to, if we're going to get a DQ off a guitar shot, can't we at least get off the shot and go to the next segment without him getting up and running off? Like where's the, th there's, he's a cyborg, which there's no sympathy on a guy. I mean, you know, I get a punch isn't going to keep him down, but maybe a, a, a gimmick, but nope. And, and I kind of think that's kinda, uh, in a lot of ways, the history of Ahmed's career, there was never, he was never vulnerable. He just wasn't. And I think it, 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 it hurt his emotional connection with the audience. So let's, um, let's talk about when you come back through the curtain you know, most of us listening to this are never going to do that. We're never going to wrestle a big match on a pay-per-view in front of a big sold out crowd and come back through the curtain. And now here we are in real life, essentially. And there's Vince or Bruce or whoever's there, but you get to connect with that other guy. What was it like? Do you remember? Take me back. Uh, you know, maybe let's visualize you walk back through the curtain disappointment man i just i when i re read the notes i was super disappointed and i don't want to say at this exact moment but certainly within the 24 hours i'm like that um that ain't scott hall feeling when i came through the curtain because when you work with scott or a razor during that time you just like all right man that was a roller coaster ride and the people enjoyed it i knew that the match didn't get over like it could have that's the disappointment um the, the old analogy that I'm sure I shared with, with, cause I've shared it working with the, the guys, do you know how and why the, the Hulk up in Hulkster days and Jerry Lawler, he did it pulling the strap down. Yeah. But the reason that works, Ahmed, there, there's really, there, there, there's only one reason it works is because he takes them to an emotional low that you have to Hulk up. If you never go low, Ahmed, you're never, there's no, there's no reason they're like, okay, he's fine. He's fine. He's fine. There's no sympathy. Other, and I'm not saying you got to, but just, it was the Goldberg thing. I mean, yeah. well, it's, and I was thinking about that just, and I didn't want to interrupt you. Bill Goldberg for the first, however many months, Eric didn't have him up there out there long enough to people say, oh, they wouldn't say this, but they would feel it. Oh, he didn't know how to do transitions. Bill did three moves and you were out. You didn't have to worry about transitions with Bill in those early days. I mean, he, it was all it was quick 15 months of buzz sauce, okay. never losing, crushing folks left and right. But then I had this conversation with Kevin Nash once, where do you go from there? Like eventually he has to lose. He can't just win for fucking ever. I agree. <laughs> Because even if he wins forever, and by the way, that's not pro wrestling. Jerry Lawler won that Memphis belt 92 times because he lost it 91. I mean, that's the way it is. Yep. Um, so people would have gotten bored with him just buzz sawing people forever because on some level you're paying for pay-per-view now and you're going to get a three-minute match. And yes, it worked for Tyson for a while, dot, 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 until it didn't. Yep. Uh, and, and it's sort of the same thing here. And and I, I get that that's that's an issue, but how was Ahmed? Was he tough to work with or deal with? I mean, I know he's green, but when you're trying to have conversations with him about, Hey, we could do this. We could do that. Does he seem receptive? I only bring that up because we've heard about guys on the other side, not trying to throw shade at anybody, but Arn Anderson mentions when Van Hammer came into WCW, he says, all right, guys, I'm here to save the company. I'm WCW's ultimate warrior. And he didn't know any better. And I believe in my heart that Van Hammer didn't know why that was offensive or how that would piss guys off or rub them the wrong way. 
He didn't know any better. Somebody above him in an office at Turner said, here's what we got in mind for you. Here's what we want you to be. Here's what we want you to do. Was Ahmed, did he have somebody in the office sort of communicating that to him or was he receptive to your, Hey man, what if type of deal? So being in a car making towns since 86, I can't tell you how many times I heard from Jerry Jarrett or others in that the only way you learn there, nothing replaces experience getting in the ring, rep after rep, rep after rep, rep after rep. And you kind of get it by osmos, osmosis and trial and error. And I knew that when I was talking to Ahmed or, or trying to coach him or teach him or whatever it may be, he had his guard up. I'm at the big time. If I'm already getting a paycheck uh, from WWF, I already know everything. I don't have to learn. So the, the, the music analogies, he never played the bars. He never played the small nightclubs. He came right in and was, uh, you know, at Madison Square Garden. So I can't say I had the word compassion, but I understood that about 90% of what I'm trying to convey, he's not going to listen. That's one thing. Then the other part of this was, I mean, whoever he was riding in the car with was going to give him their opinion. His agent was going to give him an opinion, and it's not the same agent every night. Vince was going to give an opinion. Bruce was going to give an opinion. Uh, Pat was going to get an opinion. Jeff, his opponent, was going to give an opinion. So he had so many different things being told at him. Look, I, you know, I at this time, so I'd been wrestling, what, nine years, ten years? I, I knew that he just only ring time changes that mentality, and that's it. And so I, I did everything I possibly could and never really took offense to it. Knowing, well, doing the best we can, but that was the shits. <laughs> it just, it, it was such a, it just that, especially this pay-per-view match. I was super disappointed because I just knew it could have been so much better. So it's really hard to see who the showcase is for here. I mean, it's just a tough match, square peg, ground hole. But is this the first time you've actually connected with a guitar shot over the head? Uh, for WWF, I believe so, yes. I'd done it in Dallas and Billy Travis and different angles, I think. But yes, WWF, this, I believe, this was the maiden guitar shot. And who knew that Moolah was going to join that ranks and Gary Coleman and Beetlejuice and Matt Cardona and so when you say who knew you didn't know, like you weren't thinking, man, this could be my thing. You thought it was just finished for a match. Pretty much like just because it's a gimmick, uh, would, would Vince, you know, I, I'm thinking creatively, I'm not sure Vince is going to go with the guitar every, you know, that I'm going to carry to the ring every time. Correct. We had seen a guitar over the head, of course, before honky tonk oh. man had done it a, a, a decade before. Were you concerned that? Oh man, that's somebody else's gimmick or did that not even cross your mind? No, the, the double J persona was all about, you know, cause I had been on raw and played the electric guitar or picked at it. Like I was going to sing. And, you know, I had sung it in your house and been on stage. I was a singer. I was, you know, and, and part of my shtick was world's greatest singer, world's greatest entertainer, blah, 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 blah. So I didn't really think anything about the honky talk analogy or any of that, you know, none. By the way, the torch gave it the exact same rating. This match at the Royal rumble, uh, a star and a quarter. Oh, that might've been a five star. I wasn't sure. He says the match told the story, but the finish was lame. The guitar shot should have come after a clean finish in hindsight. Do you think the match would have been better? Had you been counting the lights? Is it so, more satisfying to the audience? If he beat me, then a guitar shot. Yeah. Get your heat back Jones. Probably more resolution for the audience. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Ahmed has, um, and there's no other way for us to talk about it other than to talk about it. Uh, he said some things over the course of the years where he's done scattered little shoot interviews here, or there basically saying he didn't enjoy working with you <laughs> and even hinted around that. Well, maybe you were racist, Oh God. which my goodness, I've never heard anyone say about you ever at all anywhere. I don't even think you have to respond to that, but it does feel like sour grapes 
Like, uh, did you know you had a problem with Ahmed? Did it feel like you guys were oil and water or is this in hindsight, he's just frustrated with maybe how his wrestling life finished and, and yours continued. I'll comment on the racist thing. If anybody knew me, knew me, I growing up, uh, my best friend was African-American, uh, when I lived with my mom, it's just, it's such nonsense. Um, but here's kind of how I looked at my relationship with Ahmed, because again, I'd been around dressing rooms since I was 12. I thought that I had the same relationship with Ahmed that basically everybody else did that. Here's a guy that a million dollar look checks all the boxes could make a fortune in this industry, but he's going to be his own worst enemy until he's not. And if that is going to change, it's entirely up to him. And, and, you know, look, you, you look at hell, look at Jim Helwig. He, he wasn't really a locker room favorite, uh, when he came to Tennessee and dingo warrior out in Dallas, and then he got up North and, but you know, you, you gotta, and I know he's not everybody's favorite, but at one time, look, he learned how to work and get over and made it work for him. And it is a different era and all that, but. I, I never thought Ahmed, I guess you could say, singled me out and wanted to say those kind of comments about me. I kind of got the feeling that he felt that way about everybody. Yeah. I, I didn't know that he, I don't remember him having, now look, I'm not going to say I, I never rode with him, but you know, I, I didn't see him have a good relationship with anybody. And I'm not, I'm not knocking per se. He's just a loner, maybe what my perception of it all was, I, I never thought he singled me out. Like, Hey, I don't like double J. I never, never. That's my delusion though. Maybe, but I never thought that I just thought he wasn't enjoying his wrestling experience, but here's the problem that I always thought. Why wouldn't he think that he got hired and he's working in Madison square garden. So, Hey, I must know what I'm doing or Vince wouldn't have hired of me. Of course that's logical. That's the problem. I, I, to this day, I think that's the problem is that he never got a real understanding of the industry. And, and look, he's not the only one and certainly won't be the last one. There's guys in the industry today that really don't understand how to have a 20 or 30 year career. And then if you want to have a three year career and, and do this or do light bulbs or get in and get out more power to you. But I always viewed it, this business as a business. And I wanted to have a, a lengthy career. So looking at it through those prism, I got lucky. I'm in never looked at the business in my opinion as a business. You told me a story once before off air where you had a quote unquote old timer say something like Jeff, do you want to do this for 30 years? And he gave you some advice. Can you share that with us? Oh gosh. Which one is that? Uh, we'll come back to it. So you're not on raw the next night, but you are on superstars the next day. Any idea why is that just not enough time for TV for everybody? So we were still doing one hour rolls during that time. Yeah. Yeah. That bingo. I mean, uh, uh you know, the, you can tell by the finish G, uh, double J and Ahmed, neither one of us went over. So we were both kind of, I don't even want to say moving up the card. We were just on the pay-per-view for exposure and character development. We weren't a part of the five segments that were coming the following night. God, man, that takes you to back superstars taping. The syndicated show was still rocking and rolling during those days. Yeah, man. Hey, Hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell. So you can notice anytime we upload some new content and go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30 year loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money. It's a matter of how much. Find out right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com.